Hello everybody, um, I'm Alexandre Michy, I'm cardiologist uh, in France and I have uh, the pleasure to host uh, along uh, with uh, all my friends today uh, this excellent webinar uh, which is called the best of the ESC 2020 overview of the most important trials and guidelines. I'll just uh, try to share my screen. experience in telemedicine and e-health and to provide access to recognized experts in the field worldwide. It is a non-governmental and non-for-profit society, primarily an umbrella for national telemedicine and e-health organizations, also including associate institutional corporate individual nurse and students members. It communicates through its uh, website a quarterly newsletter, member announcements, and, and through the International Society for Terms and e e-journal. On the website, you also find a chapter with all sorts of information, which we call knowledge resources. You'll find also the recorded uh, webinars from the recent past. You will find information about the current working groups and their activities, and uh, also under education and contributions, you will find uh, chapters on history, good pro practice models, and national e-health strategies. Enjoy this webinar. Okay, so this was just a short introduction um, uh, um, explaining uh, or just some uh, actions of our working group. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank to all the participants uh, to this webinar. I know you did the important efforts to join after <coughs> a very, very tiring uh, ESC Congress. Uh, I will first of all present uh, my co-host uh, today, uh, Mr. Mihai uh, Trofenshuk. Uh, Mihai, dear Mihai, um, you have the word for a few minutes, and then I will present my uh, other co-host, uh, Professor Dan Gaita from Romania, um, member of the ESC board, which has some important information to communicate to us. So, Mihai. Hello, Alex. Uh, hello, friends. First of all, it was an extraordinary ESC Congress, and the good results from this ESC Congress demonstrated on a much lar larger scale, exactly what we have been doing here as digital pioneers. We have been doing this for a long time. So we are glad that it has been proven with a level of indication of uh, 1A that we are on the right track here at the International Society for Telemedicine, eHealth and Telecardiology. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mihai, for, for this excellent presentation. Yeah, I think you're correct. The indication is good. Yeah, 1A. <laughs> um, moreover, I, I would like to give uh, the word uh, to, to Dan, Professor Dan Gaita from Romania, which uh, um, is a member of the ESC board. Uh, hi, Dan. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Uh, how are you? Everything okay? <laughs> hey, wonderful. So. Uh... I'm very happy and honored to be here with you, and I like your your community and your uh, and your spirit and your energy. And exactly, this is the 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 way 
how uh, I'm feeling that the world, the, the, the world has to, to go in this direction. Great. Uh, how was the meeting, the ESC meeting? Um, the, the ESC, I think, had the, the most, uh, most, it was a huge Congress, in fact, no? Yes, right. Uh, starting uh, to, to, to speak about ESC Congress, I have to, to share with you that my first ESC Congress uh, I participated was in 1994. So uh, this was 16 years ago, uh, 26 years ago. And uh, I participated in each Congress. But you have to imagine living in the eastern part of Europe in 1996, I didn't receive a British visa to go to, to Birmingham. So it was the the only Congress I didn't participate live. So again, uh, we were, uh, I don't know, separated, but in fact was uh, this disadvantage was transforming a big advantage because a lot of people were able to connect and you are not only pioneers, but you are a good example of how people has to do in, in order to, to be in contact and to share the information and to be a part of the community. Yeah, I fully agree. I think this is, this is uh, uh, you know, something very new, new for all of us. And uh, well, I was, I was uh, uh, in vacation, so it was uh, pretty hard to connect, but it was very, very interesting to, to see the people, you know, the, the people we know, the friends, uh, presenting and uh, in a new format, in a new format. It's uh, maybe weird, maybe not. Uh, um, I think the, the, the good thing is that you can connect from everywhere and access the information. The bad thing, I think you, you, you don't see each other. You, you don't get to shake hands or to have a drink together. But anyway, the shaking of the hands, it's over with the virus. So uh, then uh, I, you sent me some uh, 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 two slides just before. Um, uh, can I share the two slides yes, regarding the, the Congress? And can you please comment on those, please? Okay, I will share my you. screen uh, right away. Just one second. First of all, you have to understand that uh, in the last years, the participation, the number of attendants in ESC Congress was higher than 30,000. So this year, this overpass, please, uh, I think the slideshow is the best because it's, uh, no? Um, so this is the slide showing us um, number of participants from each part of the world. So the bigger the red spot, the highest the number. Red, uh, it's uh, based on the highest number. Green, it's a low number of this. So it's based on the capital of the country. So that means it's not a blank in other part. But look uh, how many people participated, not only from United States, but look from Brazil, from South America here, also from the Asia, and of course, from the North of Africa, from Arab countries, and here for Europe, because, uh, and look uh, at the map, it's Great Britain, it's Germany, it's Italy, it's the Netherlands, it's the, the host, and was also there Romania, and the, he's the top visitor countries. So the number of participants were, the number of those who registered over past 100,000 was exactly 117,000 registered, but participated uh, with at least one uh, entrance to the, the to, to the website around 80,000 and what is important that half of them didn't participate in the, uh, or register in the past in this ESC Congress and look at this this is kind of top visitors countries and uh, big countries from Europe but also Brazil and also uh, Romania here and I'm proud that I'm part of this strong community who participate in this part and uh, of course we are sharing all these things so next please um, I think, uh, I, think uh, I don't have a next one <laughs> okay so the idea is the number of participants was very high the the format of the of the ESC Congress was combining uh, recorded session with live sessions. 
uh, a lot of new studies, a lot of uh, four guidelines, probably you will tackle all these things. So it's a start in this direction and we are starting to think how will be the next Congress next, uh, next year. We're hoping that will be a hybrid one. Uh, it will be perfect to, 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 to have a personal touch, but uh, it's a big step further in the way of how things are going in this direction. And thank you for inviting me to, to share with you this. Thank you, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, I'm just wondering, uh, some of the speakers were, um, came, came to the ESC house to record the, their sessions or... Uh, they recorded from their home, except of those who participated in person in Amsterdam and they had a special studio there with, with a green uh, color behind and they transform in a virtual studio as you said, there are a lot of uh, pictures and uh, backstage ideas and how to do, but the majority uh, re recorded uh, at their home, transforming their house in a, in a studio. Yeah, I see. Maybe, maybe it's good, maybe it's good. It depends on the house that everybody has. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Dan. Uh, this is really, really uh, very interesting information. Thank you very much uh, for all this. So let's get on with the with the webinar. Um, uh, our dear, dear colleagues and friends, which uh, will speak today, um, almost all of them uh, were all are also ambassadors um, of the ESC uh, for uh, each topic uh, and domain. So. Uh, without uh, uh, without retarding more, I will give the word to uh, Konstantin, uh, my dear friend Konstantin, to present uh, the updates on acute care. Konstantin, you have the word. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alexandro, and uh, a big thank you also to the ESC and congratulations on what they were being uh, able to pull off. More than 100,000 uh, people registered and connected. And even, I'm not sure if everybody recognized this, but all our tweets led actually to the breakdown of uh, Twitter. Um, it's still being debated if it was the ESG Congress itself or some technical difficulties. But for me, the, the case is actually closed. So I was part of the fire team, as they called us, the acute cardiac care team, together with you, Alexandro, Diego from Mexico, and uh, Rafael. And uh, if we talk about acute cardiac care, uh, one of the most uh, heavily discussed uh, uh, publications were actually the 2020 ESC guidelines for non-STEMI. 80 pages, if you have the time to go through that. If you don't have the time, I uh, strongly recommend this tutorial by Diego, perfectly summarizing the main um, findings. So I will just pick out certain topics um, out of the guidelines and just present for discussion. One is the timing of invasive strategy and uh, the main concept didn't change. So we have the very high risk patients that should go to cath lab within two hours. Those are patients in cardiogenic shock, hemodynamically unstable. And then we have the high risk uh, patients that should see the inside of a cath lab within 24 hours. But if we look here in the first uh, slide, it says P patients with a diagnosis of non-STEMI are high risk and should go to cath lab within 24 hours. So that's uh, definitely new. What about those um, that were resuscitated after an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest? We have uh, one randomized uh, clinical trial here. More are on the way. This was the COEC trial that actually looked at patients surviving an out-of-hospital cardiac arrest and had no STEMI um, on the first ECG. And uh, they uh, randomized them to an immediate coronary angio or delayed, and delayed meant after about five years. We all know the 90-day results um, that did not differ between those two approaches, and now they presented the one-year results at the ESC Congress and still no differences. And this led the ESC to uh, give a 2A uh, recommendation for a delayed angio in patients with out-of-hospital cardiac arrest without a STEMI in stable condition. Um, one particular part that has been heavily discussed, obviously, were the uh, new uh, recommendations for treatment. First, prazogel uh, should be preferred over ticagrelor based on ESA-REACT-5. And also the ESC guidelines now suggest 
not to uh, administer pretreatment uh, dual antiplatelet therapy in patients where we plan an early invasive strategy. And as we know, actually, those are all the patients with non STEMI that should see the inside of the cath lab within 24 hours. Something that I can't go in too much into detail, but very interesting. I highly recommend everybody to look at this the section on coronary artery dissection, as well as the diagnostic algorithm for Minoka. And we as acute uh, cardiac care guys, we like mechanical circulatory support. Uh, but if you look at the guidelines, it's actually a 2BC recommendation. This is actually a shame. We all like to put ECMOs. We know it's feasible, but the question is, is it reasonable? And even if you ask Holger Thiele, he says, I actually don't know. And probably these devices are overused. But what he also, also always says, if you don't know, then randomize. And the good thing is we have now four ongoing randomized control trials looking at mechanical circulatory support in cardiogenic shock. So I hope within a few years, we will change this C into an A. Uh, two more uh, publications I want to present. Reality was a very interesting uh, trial looking at anemic patients with acute myocardial infarction, and they come paired a liberal transfusion strategy, meaning uh, giving blood, uh, giving uh, red blood cells below a hemoglobin of 10 grams per deciliter versus a restrictive strategy below eight. And the restrictive strategy was non-inferior and absolutely cost-effective. And last but not least, I wanna mention the BRACE Corona trial. And they included uh, medium, uh, low to medium risk patients with COVID-19 requiring hospitalization that are on stable ACE inhibitor and or angi angiotensin receptor blocker treatment. And they looked at uh, two different strategies to suspend this treatment or to continue it. And I think the very good news for all of us is that there was no difference between those two strategies. And uh, last but, but not least, I want to thank the whole team for covering acute cardiac care, and uh, as this is a true teamwork where we work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Konstantin. And uh, being a digital congress, uh, we cannot have without a digital section. So next will be my friend, Rafael Vidal Perez, who will present you insight on digital medicine. Rafael, you have the mic. Dear Mihai, I, I, I will change. We read to, I think, has some problems with timeline. So see, we'll start with imagining if it don't matter. Of course, yeah. Of Please course. Please. Thank so you so, so much. And uh, my very great pleasure to be with amongst all of you, dear colleagues. And I will do a low brow uh, presentation using three fingers. I want to present three pearls on imaging that came up uh, during this ex extraordinary ESD um, meeting. Number one, um, the non-STEMI guidelines put CMR as a class one and with evidence, level of evidence B for diagnosing uh, Minoka, which is a huge thing because Minoka affects twice as many women. It also um, has extremely um, prognostically just the same as if you had a single vessel or double vessel disease. And it has about a 50% chance of reinfarction within a year. So this is a huge step and shows how advanced the ESC is. The number second thing that I want to keep in mind, uh, it also relates to the ESC guidelines on exercise, where they highlighted mitral valve prolapse. And there were four imaging um, aspects to mitral valve prolapse that actually are higher risk for sudden cardiac death. And you must know those things because you will be advising these patients on exercise. And they include bileaflet mitral valve prolapse, and um, LGE in the inferior basal region, if you go that far to CMR, if they have severe LV dysfunction or if they have severe MR. And to keep in mind number three, which has to do with LVOT obstruction, which came up in the mastitation um, study, Explorer HCM. And in this study, elderly patients over the age of 65 
mostly had symptomatic relief. These are patients that we have the most difficulty dealing with because many of them have hypertension and they get to um, placed on, on uh, vasodilators and that makes their LVOT obstruction worse. And this study showed a substantial reduction in symptoms and an LVOT gradient to keep in mind as you take care of patients. So thank you so very much for allowing me my two cents or three cents. Thank you so much, Rita. Uh, we really appreciate your participation uh, and hope to see you soon. Uh, so as Mihai said, uh, next is uh, Rafael. Hello, Rafael. You need to unmute. Activate your mic. I mean, I come in with the sound. Sorry, uh, I was fighting with one. I see. My, I hope you see my screen. Well, this is a short update about digital about what we made in as the ambassadors. You show the figures, so I think they are clear. The map. So this one one hundred thousand and the big increase from previous congress. What is the reach of a digital event that doubles? the physical or triple the number. So I think a good opportunity for young people, as you see the change, and also for many countries that's difficult to attend. And this is where the Twitter numbers, I think they are huge, massive. Also, I think there are sort of digital elements, three, 300 million impressions, I think it's amazing. And a lot of, a lot of tweets. Uh, for digital, we have two options to follow this uh, channel of digital health, but also in the special and the spotlight, we have sessions interesting on digital aspects. I recommend you two presentations. I think they are very interesting. There's one for artificial intelligence for images. It's a nice summary of, of all the technologies that are running on imaging on this topic. And another one that is very interesting because it has a great uh, role is the digital health on, on, on natural fibrillation, no? that, that we have many things there to do. One, one data presented is the value for, for example, of a smartphone strategy using social media, used in China for secondary prevention. I think it's something easy, not complex to, to deal with, with um, uh, central control and um, some measurements that the patient has, has to do, but it's a short uh, strategy with messaging and social media and you can get good changes on secondary prevention, good control, better adherence. So I think it's something that, that it's a, some, a strategy that is shown to be useful in many trials. It's another one, but I think it's something that shows where the things go. How could be the cardiology of 2030? It was from a lecture from uh, Martin Cowie. I think it's interesting because he explains that probably the, it was going to be a role for artificial intelligence, wearables, and Internet of Things, on what things the doctor can use in the future. Some people say that probably in 2020 you can use many of these things. Um, this, I think, is one of the most interesting lectures that you can have to check in the platform of the EC Congress, that it was the lecture for innovation, is what you get from the ECG using it in artificial intelligence. And I think from the Mayo Clinic, I recommend you to see it. I show you a few things, like with your normal ECG, you can know which patients are going to get atrial fibrillation in the follow-up. It seems like something magic. Probably there is, it's better than a halter. The artificial intelligence gets a 10-second ECG in something similar to a halter to screen atrial fibrillation. Maybe we have signals in the ECG that came from somewhere that are shown in the ECG and you can predict where what patients get AFib. I think it's something of, of interest to be followed, but also this is a material could get you also to know if your heart is, is, is with a LV depression. So I think you get more information from the CG than even than an echocardiogram. And if I have to check something on the digital arena from the trials, the only one that deals with digital things is the impact AFib. That is a trial from, from Duke, but use a very interesting platform of the FDA uh, for investigation. I think it will be nice to be used in more years to come because it, it, it allows you to study 
things related with pharmacovigilance or resilience, etc. But in this case, we're checking what was the evidence, and if the patient with some action, you can get more evidence for oral anticoagulation. Then they send some information to patients. Um, in this case, the, the trial was not positive, but we have to say what was the intervention. The intervention, as I will show you here in the discussion lead for Christophe Leclerc, the intervention was to send a single mail. Maybe one mail doesn't make a miracle. So probably we need more, how to say, more better intervention to be tested, probably to see if an electronic strategy could be, could be useful. And um, my last slide goes for doing some advertisement that I think is of interest. This is preparing another digital congress. In this case, it's the digital summit that makes in Estonia last year. This year is going to be like a week. If I check in the, in the ESC web page, probably it will be digital like this ESC digital experience. And I have to say that we have a new journal on the family of the European Health Journal that is Digital Health, and we are waiting for just your submission. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Rafael. And um, at this Congress also, we took the failure of the heart and we transform it into the success of cardiology. So next, I present you Han Nong Tun, aka Henry. He will present insights from heart failure ambassadors. Han. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and dear colleagues. I'm Dr. Hannah Henry Han from Myanmar. So I'm going to discuss or show you about the, the brief review of the heart failure trial that was being breaking in the ESC's 2020s. So what ESC 2020 left promising hold in cardiology practice was heart failure management. So first of all, NPAR trial. This trial gave a promising hold for NPAR. Uh, in, in this trial, the so impact glyphosate in half failure rejection fraction is a very nice and tested result. So when you look at it here, so impact glyphosate and which is a placebo, and when you compare to this trial, the cardiovascular death or the hospitalization or heart failure was a significantly reducing and impacted frozen. Then if you look at the primary outbreaks, a kind of a pre-specified group for impacted frozen and placebo, as you're gonna see here for ischemic heart failure and then ischemic heart failure and heart failure with the anti mp fight as well as for a heart failure hospitalization is a significantly reducing and impacted frozen. So in our camp, so primary N5 with 25% reduced in the risk, and you also see this 30% reduced in the heart failure hospitalization risk, and as well as the 50% reduced in the renal event. This trial gives a promising hope that I attended, uh, uh, the impact liposin is to be added in the next ESC heart failure guideline on a top of the standard guideline ter therapy. So overall, a many patients receiving a recombinant therapy for heart failure the impact levels in significantly reduce in cardiovascular death or hospitalization for heart failure than those in the placebo group, regardless of the presence or absence of diabetes. So now we have a compelling advantage that this SGLT2 inhibitor, now we can use it to currently add it for treatment for this disease. So another interesting trial in this ESC 2020, the Explorer ACM. This trial has recently been published in the Lancet Journal. So what about the Mavagadam? So it is this new drug that is a cardiac myosin inhibitor to reduce the actin myosin cross barrier and to prevent it in paralyzation and hypertrophy of this chiromyopathy. The Explorer ACM is a pivotal phase three randomized trial. When you look back to the previous the phase two Marbury trial, it shows the promising health in its efficacy and safety body. In this trial, they enrolled a patient with the LVOD gradient equal or greater than 15 millimeter mercury with a new high classification from two to three with Marvacate and for placebo for tetiwiti. The trial was conducted at a 68 site in Tetis country. The primary endpoint was uh, to specifically demonstrate benefit in both symptom and function. A secondary endpoint was designed as for LVOD post exercise the gradient and oxygen consumption and an ISS class and a patient with uh, hypertrophic uh, chiromyopathy question and shortness of breath score. When you look at it here, 
So we have a very nice uh, data from the Magai Cat Amps uh, group, which uh, 26 prices was reduced in a you know, so you has less classification. And you look at to the secondary amplifier, the distress is significantly reduced in a peak oxygen conception and KCC2 and heart failure hospitalization as well. So Mavagadan is the first developed target to treat a molecular detect of the HCM. In, the, in this HCM, the randomized control trial, the Mavagadan improved the same time and exercise capacity as well as a health status in patients with HOCM. So what about this safety project? So we need a, a last trial to look for the longer use of the mavagadan, but mavagadan might also be beneficial in younger patients with high antibiotic B and further clinical studies are needed for the safety. So here's a big question about the long-term safety. So can we give a for a decade in a safe manner? but we don't know it yet. We need a further clinical study, but clearly. Here's another interesting trial of parallelism. This trial was conducted in the heart failures preserve ejection fraction from the uh, New York classification two to four with ejection fraction more than 40% with an elevated antibrobium level. And the patient participants were 2,572 patients for 24 weeks. If you look at it here, this patient, the patient in the age trial had a mean age of a 73 year and the left, left ventricular agitation fraction baseline was a 56%. What about the outcome? So let's hear. The circulatory vasodilatory group in the agitation fraction is not a significant, but I mean the uh, heart failure hospitalization is not a reduced as well. But uh, we can see anti and people is statistically significant in psychosocial vasodilatory group. But unfortunately, the so new heart class clarification and then heart failure hospitalization was not significantly reduced in the uh, psychosocial vasodilatory So these trials are consistent with the finding from Paragon HF trial. So we can also see that the previous, the Paramount phase two trial, uh, the trial also approved it uh, Psychofacial vasodilatory is a greater reducing in anti B. So, this is a fantastic trial for the Dabasticade. So, Dabasticade flows in on a chronic kidney disease patient. So, uh, this, this trial conducted uh, with uh, 4,304 patients in three, 386 centers from 21 country. So, the participants were uh, over 80 years, uh, 18 years with uh, EGFR 25 to 75, but urinary albumin creatinine ratio, so more than 20 milligrams. Per day. So when you look at the parameter outcome results, it, this is, is a fantastically impressive numerical number, statically in reduced the dabapilose in R compared with the placebo. So what about the secondary alpha the renal data? Uh, the public goes in on the significantly reduced on chronic dialysis, kidney transportation, and renal debt. So the result you can see here is the overall relative, relative risk reduction is 39% on the public goes in and, and all cause mortality for secondary outcome is 31% on the public goes in compared with the placebo group. So when, when we look at about the safety, there was no table exact advanced event seen on the Dabar glucosin group. So it's a quite safe drug as we have seen it live as a Dabar issue of trial. So what about this key message for a, this for a heart failure trial? So in Dabar glucosin, it's a promising drug that is to be added in our standard care therapy for heart failure, which is digestion fraction, which is chronic kidney diseases. So th this trial has shown the Dabar glucosin potential as long as weight as need a treatment patient for patient with CKD patient. So to, to conclusion, the black reduces reduce the risk of kidney failure and prolong the survival rate, and also reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. This is the same result for the late Reagan trial for heart failure in year 2020. So we have a two positive trial for the Empire Reduce and Dava CKD, and a one failed trial in parallel, uh, but uh, the, as you see, the, there's a diffi difficult group for the heart failures with the fraction to check out with the pharmacotherapy. 
So the Explorer ACM is a you know, promising drug that we need to look for the lumbar safety, but it's a good drug for our a patient with the HOCM. This is a very popular slide and famous slide we used to share in the previous ESC 2020. So now we have a five drug. So we have a four drug with a five, five pathway to, you know, the ACI or ARB, naturalism inhibitor, beta blocker, and MRA and S2 inhibitor. So we have a four drug to block the all of this pathway to improve our quality of care in heart failure. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Henry. Yeah, this was a, a, an excellent overview um, uh, with a little bit uh, passing the time, but thank you very much. It was excellent overview. So it's my pleasure to uh, present uh, to you Ruben uh, from Belgium. Thank you very much, Ruben, for joining us. Um, Ruben will present to us details about uh, arrhythmia and everything uh, that is related to arrhythmia. Can you share your screen now? Yes, please. Hi. Hi, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alexandru, for this. It's really a pleasure to share with you this evening, commenting all the interesting themes uh, of this Congress. And I also would like to congratulate the International Society for Telemedicine and eHealth for this organization. And I honor to commend the most important things that happened in the field of cardiac arrhythmias. I would like also to say that it has been a pleasure to share with all my colleagues in Twitter our impressions and what we have felt. And, and well, I think that this initiative will help us even to interact even more. The most important thing that I would like to share is the new guidelines of atrial fibrillation and the most important thing is that they are, as you can see here, they are patient-centered. So they are focused on the patient. So we have to better integrate the patient in our work uh, every day. So the patient should be uh, interrogated, should be implicated in every decision since the beginning. That is an important thing of these guidelines. And also in the, in, in, during all the process of these guidelines, a lot of patients have been implicated. Yeah? So we have to explore, explore the values of the patients, the goals and the, the preference of them. There, are, there is a four E's exam as an example for these guidelines. So we have to assess stroke risk, the severity of symptoms and the AFI burden, that is a new concept that has been implicated in these guidelines. Also, the integration of new technology like uh, cardiac MRI, biomarkers has a role in these new guidelines. And I would like to comment what has changed mostly. Eh? Now we have the concept of tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy in these new guidelines, that is a class one indication for ablation. Also, Another important thing is that the difference between paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, persistent atrial fibrillation has totally disappeared. So no, no matter what kind of atrial fibrillation is in front of you, there is a class one indication to propose an atrial fibrillation ablation. Also, new drugs, eh, old drugs, but that we all know very well, Amiodarone has now changed for a class one indication, but we have also to consider what perhaps is better to use other drugs before, but that is an important step also. Another important thing is that uh, we already know the control of blood pressure is very is critical for, to avoid a new crisis of atrial fibrillation. Now it's a class one indication but one important thing is that the, the importance of uh, physical activity has been downgraded to, to a, we don't know why, but we'll have to discuss in the near future, all that kind of things. Another important thing is that we should use tools to, for the risk assessment of bleeding, and also a, a step forward uh, for the use of oral anticoagulants, new oral anticoagulants. So if we are not, we are not able to control the, the anticoagulation with, with uh, warfarin or other old drugs. 
This is in relation to the guidelines. I also would like to, to propose you to have a look to this a rate AFI trial. Um, this is a small trial that um, has been used to compare uh, beta blockers or digoxin for long-term heart rate control of atrial fibrillation. Why? Because as you already know, digoxin has a bad publicity in the, in the past, but, but if we have a look to this uh, uh, randomized control trial that has been, has been taken in the Great Britain, you can see that the controlled heart rate is more or less the same, but the most important thing is that the quality of life is much more better with digoxin against uh, beta blockers, and also you can see here NIHA is better and also the provenpe is also better with digoxin. So, we are not saying that we are going to change our clinical practice, but I think that this is a note for us, a flag telling us that digoxin is not as bad as, bad as we can imagine in the past. Eh? Also, if you have a look to the adverse events, you can see that they are not as bad as we, you can imagine. So it's lower with digoxin than with beta blockers. Mm -hmm. I would like also to say that we have discussed in this Congress a lot about lifestyle modifications for the treatment of atrial fibrillation. This is a summary of the comprehensive risk factor studies that I would like to share with you. That is important, we have discussed a lot. And also, uh, also the Dr. Rafael Vidal have already discussed some many trials in the field. I, don't, I would like to insist on that, but that there are new technologies that are, that are, uh, that are arriving, that, like pulse field ablation in persistent atrial fibrillation, same day discharge in AFib, new technologies, basic science in the operating room, digital health screening for atrial fibrillation, and artificial intelligence in the context of ventricular tachycardia and atrial fibrillation. So, in a resume, I would say that the new guidelines are going to change a lot of things in the field. And also, we will go into to see the, the past of all molecules that are going to return to our field in electrophysiology. I would like to thank you very much, all my colleagues, and the invitation today. Thank you very much, Ruben, for your, your interesting uh, briefing. So, we are always asking what will the future bring to us so directly from Australia, from another time zone. I believe it's 3 a.m. in the morning. I present you Anastasia, Anastasia Mihai Ludu, and she will present you insights into hypertension directly from the future. Thank you, Mihai, and thank you everybody for inviting me to take part in this uh, fantastic initiative and great to see everybody. I'll share my screen now and I'll promise to keep it brief because we want to talk about it. I must say, um, obviously, um, in terms of hypertension, the BPLTTC, which was the blood pressure lowering for prevention of cardiovascular events across different levels of blood pressure, created a lot of interest because it's quite exciting. The reason um, I'm excited so much is because it mandates that we should be treating blood pressure based on risk rather than the level. And it's, it's important that a key theme, and, and Ruben touched on this for AF, but one thing that I found at, uh, at the ESC Congress this year was in terms of hypertension management across the different st streams, it was about lifestyle modifications, how important they are as first line treatment, and also in terms of monitoring. So this uh, particular uh, uh, meta-analysis is timely to actually refocus the efforts on um, management of um, hypertension. The, the rationale was, as you, all of you are aware, it, it was to, to look at the different, different effects of blood pressure for preventing cardiovascular events in primary versus secondary prevention. Why is that important? Because there's been some question about whether they're different uh, thresholds, and that's caused confusion. 
the, the, the strength of this meta-analysis, and we don't have the details of how it's done, there are a lot more questions to be resolved in terms of side effects, in terms of different medication, because they didn't specify, it, it was based on either against placebo or other treatments, so we don't have the specifics yet, but it was 50 randomised control, or approximately 50 randomised control trials, and 350,000 patients. The best part about it, as we all know, uh, that we love to look at uh, uh, sex differences to make sure that what we're advocating has equal effect in females and males. It had the high, highest proportion of uh, women in this trial. It was around 40 to 50%. So uh, um, I was really excited to hear the results. And it, followed, it, it, it tracked randomised controlled trials that had follow-up up to about four years. So, oops. Um, not going. Can you see that now? Yeah, yeah, we can see yeah, that. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry, I had it on, uh, yeah. So what it showed was that you can see here, across every major uh, um, cardiovascular event, whether it was stroke, ischemic heart disease, heart failure, or cardiovascular death, there was a, a, a significant reduction in these events. Uh, and the important thing is that it didn't matter whether you had cardiovascular disease ahead before treatment was initiated or whether there was no cardiovascular disease. And it's shown in the next slide here where, and I don't know if my pointer shows up. I guess it does, yeah. So whether you had known prior cardiovascular disease or no known prior cardiovascular disease, for every five mil across, independent of what uh, level you started, whoops, sorry, <laughs> independent of what the level you started, it didn't matter. You, you got the same level of uh, uh, improvement in terms of reduction in cardiovascular events. And that's a significant impact because it means that we should be looking at risk rather than uh, blood pressure level or whether it's being measured. And so it takes the emphasis away against the numbers, which we, we've all known for a while, but it gives more information in terms of looking at the individual. And it leads me to the next uh, uh, talk that I'd like to highlight, and apologies for just giving you two excerpts. There was a debate on Saturday about whether you know, we're ready for precision medicine. And the reason I put this up is because it highlighted a significant uh, result that no two individuals are the same. And when we talk about precision, we all think about genetic analysis and, and everything, but it was an elegant uh, debate. Uh, uh, Professor Christian Deleuze gave a great presentation at for, for Pro in looking at, we can now have equipment that precisely measures blood pressure. We can look at genetics but, and, and many other factors, uh, but we, we really are not using that. So we really do need to think about lifestyle modifications, we've got to think about gen uh, the genetic makeup, but also think about circumstances, socioeconomic factors play an impact in terms of adherence. So with that, I'll uh, leave it um, um, so that, move out of stop sharing, so that it leaves times for discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Anastasia, and thank you very much for your effort to be awake. Uh, I think it's around three o'clock in the morning in Australia, so I hugely appreciate that. Thank you very much. And the, the, all the information you presented was very, very interesting. So uh, I will go on forwards. Um, my dear colleague Mirwat Alasnag from uh, Saudi Arabia will present uh, us uh, news uh, and updates from interventional cardiology. Hi, Mirwat. How are you? Hi, Alex. How are you? Um, thank you for doing this and allowing us to give some bite-sized summaries uh, of this phenomenal meeting. Um, ESC was a fantastic digital experience for all of us, and I was uh, in charge of the interventional track. So here are very quick summaries uh, just to keep Anastasia and everybody else awake. Uh, the first one is the popular TAVI spoken. You know, a lot of people have already discussed it before. Very briefly, uh, about 690 patients without any underlying indication for oral anticoagulation were randomized to either aspirin alone or aspirin with clopidogrel for three months. Primary endpoint was all bleeding and non procedural bleeding. Um, secondary endpoints was a composite of cardiovascular death, non procedural related bleeding, ischemic stroke, or MI at one year. 
um, bleeding in the composite of, bleed, of bleeding or thromboembolic events at one year were significantly less frequent with the aspirin alone arm compared with the aspirin and clopidogrel, not surprising actually. Um, but interestingly here is we have to recognize that TAVI patients generally are a high bleeding risk population. So calculating the bleeding risk in these patients is actually critical to uh, care. However, we cannot extrapolate about regards to leaflet thrombosis because there's no imaging in this uh, study. But again, remember that there's poor correlation between imaging or image confirmed uh, leaflet thrombosis and clinical uh, events. Once again, we need to be a little cautious because a good percentage, approximately 20% of the patients present uh, in this trial eventually required PCI or developed new atrial fibrillation, in which case aspirin alone does not suffice. Uh, this is not widely applicable, so it's not applicable to valve and valve and bicuspid valves, which is a growing area in uh, the area of um, TABI. Once again, although both the um, self-expanding and balloon-expandable valves were used, it wasn't powered enough to give you a sub-analysis on the type of uh, transcatheter heart valve. Um, PCR Online has an interview um, covering this, and I encourage you to uh, review it. The next big trial was the Voyager PAD. Um, now adding small dose of rivaroxaban or PAD dose rivaroxaban as we call it, the 2.5 milligrams twice daily, uh, plus aspirin in patients with established peripheral vascular disease who have undergone revascularization and have now concomitant coronary disease against aspirin alone. There was a significant reduction in the incidence of the composite outcome of acute limb ischemia, major amputations, MI, ischemic stroke or cardiovascular death. Timmy major bleeding did not differ significantly between the groups. However, the ISTH major bleeding was slightly higher uh, in the rivaroxaban and aspirin arm. Uh, however, they did use a modified definition, which perhaps captured more bleeds than what was conventionally known. Overall, there's a net benefit, and perhaps patients with polyvascular disease are the ones that will benefit from this kind of a re regimen most. The next is colchicine. There was a lot of talk about colchicine, both in chronic coronary syndromes and acute coronary syndromes. So the COLCAT trial, um, this actually looked at colchicine in acute coronary syndromes or myocardial infarction. It was early initiation within the first three days of low dose colchicine in acute myocardial infarction, and it showed that it reduced the risk of composite of cardiovascular death, resuscitated cardiac arrest, MI, stroke, or urgent rehospitalizations for angina that required uh, revascularization. And that was perhaps the driver of all events. But keep in mind that this resembles a post hoc analysis, whereby the timing of the administration of colchicine wasn't actually randomized, and that perhaps can confound uh, the results. The low dose colchicine 2 trial, this is, uh, it was a very respectable trial. Over 5,000 patients were uh, uh, enrolled in this trial. Those with established chronic coronary syndrome disease that was diagnosed, not presumed, because many parts of the world just presume a diagnosis of coronary disease based on chest pain. But these were patients who had confirmed diagnoses uh, for more than six months. They were randomized to low dose colchicine uh, against a placebo. Ex important exclusions were actually advanced kidney disease and valvular disease. Bear in mind, there was a run-in period of approximately uh, six weeks in these patients where withdrawal happened in those who are intolerant to colchicine. So I would caution from the over-enthusiastic interpretation um, that the colchicine was well tolerated in approximately 90% of the patients that were involved in this trial. There was low representation of women and diabetics, once again, warranting caution in interpreting this trial uh, in these uh, subsets. Once again, there was a signal to more, more non-cardiac mortalities, um, unexplained really, but bear it in mind, although it was statistically insignificant. Um, again, it may be reasonable to use it in those with polyvascular disease and, revas and uh, recurrent events. Finally, the ischemia study. You can't uh, cover the interventional track without looking looking at this one. This is actually a sub-study of the main ischemia trial, which looked at revascularization against conservative care in those with ischemic heart disease. Bear in mind that patients with significantly depressed LV dysfunction were actually excluded from the main uh, ischemia trial. So this sub-study, what they saw is that in patients with ischemia and heart failure, so clinical heart failure, and an injection fraction between 35 and 45 percent, an early invasive strategy may improve event-free survival. The invasive versus conservative therapy was associated with a low uh, rate of the primary endpoint. And in those without heart failure uh, and, uh, and had LV dysfunction, invasive therapy was not associated with a benefit. 
Once again, remember, this is a subgroup analysis with small numbers that are enrolled. So at best, it's hypothesis generating and no hard uh, conclusions can be made. The clinical heart failure appears to be the driver here. And um, we cannot determine the best form of revascularization in this group. Previous studies have told us that cabbage is actually the best revascularization modality in patients with significant LV dysfunction, but between 35 and 45, uh, I don't think there's many discriminatory studies. Um, and I think I'll leave you with that. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much, uh, Mirvat. Uh, this is truly very interesting information um, you provided. Um, so I will uh, present the following speaker, uh, which is Dr. Ahmed Monsen uh, from Egypt. Um, uh, dear Ahmed, um, you will, you will uh, present to us some details also regarding arrhythmia and especially the atrial fibrillation guidelines. This was uh, already uh, discussed uh, slightly by uh, Ruben, but I think this is a huge uh, and a very important guideline. So it would be good to have a, a second uh, um, uh, second uh, overview. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for joining. You have the word. Thank you so much, uh, dear Dr. Alex, for your kind invitation. It's a great uh, honor for me to join this elegant scientific meeting. I will talk about what's new in the ESC guidelines for management of atrial fibrillation. I will try to summarize the new recommendation in about 12 points. Let's start with recommendation for screening to detect AF. When screening for AF, it is recommended that the individuals undergoing screening are informed about the significance and the treatment implication of detecting AF. A structured referral platform is organized for screen positive cases for further physician-led clinical evaluation to confirm the diagnosis of AF and to provide the optimal management of patients with confirmed AF. And very important, definite diagnosis of AF in screen positive cases is established only after the physician. So maybe Ahmed uh, has, uh, doesn't have a very good internet. The second recommendation is about the prevention of thromboembolic events in AF. Stroke and bleeding risk reassessment at periodic intervals is recommended to inform the treatment decision, such as initiation of oral anticoagulation in patients no longer at low risk of stroke and address the potentially modifiable bleeding risk factors. For a formal risk score based assessment of bleeding risk, the has bled score should be considered to help address the modifiable risk factors and to, the, to identify patients at high risk of bleeding, those with has bled score three or more for early and more frequent clinical review and follow-up. In patients with AF initially at low risk of stroke, first reassessment of stroke risk should be made four to six months after the index evaluation. Estimated bleeding risk in absence of absolute contraindication to oral anticoagulation should not in itself guide the treatment decision for oral anticoagulation in stroke prevention. Rather, we should try to correct this modifiable risk factor. The clinical pattern of AF, either first detected paroxysmal, persistent, or long-standing persistent, or permanent, should not condition the indication for thromboprophylaxis. Then we will talk about recommendation for cardioversion. Pharmacological cardioversion of AF is of the thromboembolic risk. For patients with sick sinus syndrome, EV conduction disturbances or prolonged QT above 500 milliseconds, pharmacological cardioversion should not be attempted unless the risk for broarrhythmia and bradycardia have been considered. Then we will talk about recommendation for rhythm control or catheter ablation of AF. For the decision on AF catheter ablation, it is recommended to take into consideration the procedural risk and the major risk factor for AF recurrence following the procedure and discuss them with the patients. Repeated pulmonary vein isolation procedures should be considered in patients with AF recurrence 
provided that the patient's symptoms were improved after the initial pulmonary vein isolation. AF catheter ablation for pulmonary vein isolation should be considered for rhythm control after one failed or intolerant to beta blocker treatment to improve symptoms of AF recurrence in patients with paroxysmal and persistent AF. AF a catheter ablation for pulmonary vein isolation should or may be considered as a first line rhythm control therapy to improve symptoms in selected patients with symptomatic paroxysmal AF episodes as a class 2A recommendation or persistent AF without major risk factors for AF recurrence as an alternative to antiarrhythmic drugs considering the patient choice benefit and risk as a class 2B recommendation. Use of additional ablation lesion beyond the pulmonary vein isolation may be considered, but it is not well established. The strict control of the risk factors and the avoidance of the triggers are recommended as a part of rhythm control strategy and this is was given a class one recommendation. We will talk about the recommendation for stroke risk management pericardioversion. It is recommended that the importance of adherence and the persistence to NOAC treatment both before and after cardioversion is strongly emphasized to the patient. In patients with EF duration, more than 24 hours undergoing cardioversion, therapeutic anticoagulation should be continued for at least four weeks, even after successful cardioversion to sinus rhythm. Beyond four weeks, the decision about long-term oral anticoagulation treatment is determined by the presence of stroke risk factors based on the CHADVASC score. In patients with definite duration of AF less than 24 hours and with very low stroke risk, CHADVASC score zero in male or one in female, post-cardioversion anticoagulation for four weeks may be omitted. What about the recommendation for stroke risk management pericatheter ablation? In AF patients with stroke risk factors not taking oral anticoagulation before ablation, it is recommended that the pre-procedural management of a stroke risk includes the initiation of anticoagulation and preferably therapeutic oral anticoagulation for at least three weeks before ablation as a class one recommendation or alternatively to use the transesophageal echo to exclude left atrial and left atrial appendage thrombus before ablation as a class 2A recommendation. For patients undergoing AF catheter ablation who have been therapeutically anticoagulated with warfarin, dabigatran, rivaroxaban, apixaban, or edoxaban, performance of ablation procedure without oral anticoagulation interruption is recommended. What about recommendation for long-term antiarrhythmic drugs? duty interval, serum potassium level, creatinine clearance, and other proarrhythmia risk factors is recommended. In AF patients treated with flicanide for long-term rhythm control, concomitant use of EV nodal blocking drug, if tolerated, should be considered. Sotalol may be considered for long-term rhythm control in patients with normal left ventricular function, or with ischemic heart disease if close monitoring of QT interval, serum potassium level, creatinine clearance, and the other proarrhythmia risk factors is provided. What about the recommendation for lifestyle intervention and the management of risk factors and the concomitant diseases in AF? Identification and the management of risk factors and the concomitant diseases is recommended as an integral part of treatment in AF patients. Modification of unhealthy lifestyle and the targeted therapy of intercurrent conditions is recommended to reduce the AF burden 
and symptom severity. Portionistic screening for AF is recommended in or AF should be considered in patients with obstructive sleep apnea. What about the recommendation for patients with AF and acute coronary syndrome? In patients with AF with acute coronary syndrome undergoing an uncomplicated BCI, early cessation of aspirin after one week and the continuation of dual therapy with oral anticoagulation and P2Y12, preferably colobidogrel, for up to 12 months is recommended if the risk of stent thrombosis is low or concern about bleeding risk reveal over concern about the risk of stent thrombosis irrespective of the stent type. What about chronic coronary syndrome with atrial fibrillation? After uncomplicated PCI, early cessation after one week of aspirin and the continuation of dual therapy with oral anticoagulation for up to six months. And clobidogrel is recommended if the risk of stent thrombosis is low or concern about bleeding risk reveal over the concern of risk of stent thrombosis irrespective of the stent type. What about recommendation for management of active bleeding on oral anticoagulation? Four factor prothrombin complex concentrates should be considered in AF patients on vitamin K antagonists who develop a severe bleeding complication. And what about the recommendation for management of atrial fibrillation during the pregnancy as regards the acute management? In pregnant women with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, Cardioversion should be considered for persistent atrial fibrillation. Eputilide or flicanide heart. What about the long term management in pregnant women with AF? Flicanide, propafenone, or sotalol should be considered to prevent AF if AV block if if you know that blocking drugs fail, digoxin or verapamil should be considered for rate control if theta blockers fail. And finally, the recommendations for postoperative atrial fibrillation, longer term oral anticoagulation therapy to prevent thromboembolic events should be considered in patients at a risk for stroke with postoperative AF after non-cardiac surgery considering the anticipated net clinical benefit of oral anticoagulation and the informed patient preferences. Beta blockers should not be used routinely for prevention of post-operative atrial fibrillation in patients undergoing non-cardiac surgery. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ahmed, for your uh, very detailed presentation. Uh, one of the most expected guidelines, uh, it was an STEMI guideline with a great impact uh, for our uh, daily hospital uh, work. Uh, Aliu Filonid from Macedonia will present you an STEMI guidelines. Aliu, you have the mic. Good evening, everyone. I hope you can see me well. And it's a real pleasure to be here among you tonight, to among this great academia and great doctors. Uh, I will uh, continue to share my screen now so you can view my slides. Uh, hopefully we'll have no problem here. So, um, uh, okay, let's do this. So these are the most uh, important updates on the ANSTEMI guidelines in the ESC 2020. As uh, Dr. Constantin also touched on the subject, I will just be refreshing and still uh, uh, pointing your attention towards the most important ones. So um, about the ESC, it's been, uh, it's been a special year for all of us this year uh, because of COVID-19, but uh, uh, we managed as, as we are uh, trained in daily uh, tackling problems. We managed to tackle this problem too, so we had 100k registration on the first day, uh, which is a huge interest for the ESC. And, uh, but it still remains to be uh, said that the ischemic heart diseases still remain the number one killer in the world despite the COVID-19. And uh, uh, continuing with the new 
uh, new guidelines and the impact uh, on our practice. So uh, the new guidelines have touched into the rapid rule out and rule in algorithms. They have uh, taken, taken uh, special consideration on the risk stratification for early invasive approaches. Uh, they have uh, defined and further, let's say, defined the high bleeding risk and high and very high ischemic risk scores. And uh, they have uh, mentioned uh, gaps in the evidence and corresponding uh, trials to be performed in the future um, so that we can continue lessering the burden uh, of cardiovascular diseases. Also, they have introduced new sections and they have uh, uh, further um, concentrated our, our uh, uh, our work into the in following important topics. Uh, they have uh, clarified some things about MINOCA. They also have mentioned and have clarified about SCAD, the spontaneous coronary artery dissection, and also uh, in the interest of um, institutions and in the, in the uh, final interest of patients, they have uh, uh, put the quality indicators in uh, acute coronary syndrome treatments. So I'll just start uh, and dive into the rapid rule in and rule out algorithm. So now as a level one, it is uh, alternatively to the uh, zero hour and first hour algorithm. Uh, it is also recommended to use the zero and two hour algorithm with blood sampling at zero hour and two hour, depending if there is a high sensitive uh, cardiotroponin test, which can be validated. Um, also, it's worth mentioning that for diagnostic purposes, uh, the routine measure of additional biomarkers that may have been used uh, in our clinic in Skopje, we do not use them uh, uh, routinely, but somewhere they may have been used. So again, they are not, not recommended to be used. Uh, seeing the, uh, seeing the uh, concentrating of the table, uh, when we have an, a suspected uh, non-STEMI acute coronary syndrome patient, uh, we have, of course, three logic logical uh, approaches, the rule out, observe, and rule in. So uh, taking the, the zero hour and one hour approach, uh, we need to concentrate, of course, on the uh, zero hour level of uh, high sensitive troponin. And of course, after the one hour uh, result, the one hour measure, if there is a delta uh, cumulative uh, important rise in the troponin, which of course, uh, together with clinical uh, evaluation of the patients and uh, ECG and other signs may, will uh, uh, give us guidelines on, on what to choose next. So again, on, in, this, uh, in this part, the zero and one hour algorithm is favored. The additional changes in diagnostic approach um, um, uh, if, if we look at the 2015 versus the 2020 guidelines, is that uh, um, it was uh, uh, considered that uh, well, we should, uh, we should uh, have the, the acute coronary syndromes uh, use, uh, acute coronary syndrome approaches use uh, 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 visual aids or visual techniques, but now the CCTA is recommended as an alternative to invasive angiography to uh, exclude ACS as a, as a tool in, those, in the pool of patients with uh, uh, low to intermediate likelihood of uh, coronary artery disease. Uh, tending the rhythm monitoring, so rhythm monitoring up to 24 hours or to PCI, whichever comes first, of course, is recommended in non-semi patients at low risk, while at those with high risk, uh, uh, at high risk for uh, increased for uh, cardiac arrhythmias, rhythm monitoring for more than 24 hours is now recommended. So uh, they also also um, uh, devoted some uh, more importance to the high and very high ischemic risk and the bleeding risk stratifications. So the very high risk now in, uh, is uh, very high risk patients are those who include a history of multiple major ACCVD events or one major ACCVD event in uh, uh, or multiple high risk conditions. So those are now the very high risk ischemic, the very high ischemic risk. Uh, while the bleeding stratification, the crusade bleeding risk score has been, uh, has been favored. Also the ARC HBR, which I will show in the next slide has been, uh, has been favored as the bleeding risk stratification for uh, choosing uh, um, pharmacological approach 
during a not STEMI event. So these are the major and minor criteria, criteria for high uh, bleeding risk. Uh, so the bleeding risk is high if at least one major or two minor criteria are met. This uh, table, I will not spend a lot of time on this because this can be easily found. It's just that uh, now in the acute setting, uh, this is the table favored and this should be, is, is suggested to be used if there is a doubt on, on the bleeding risk uh, versus the ischemic risk. So from in the terms of pharmacotherapy, there, is, uh, there are changes uh, as uh, uh, Dr. Constantine earlier noted, prosopril should be considered in preference to ticagrelol for non-STEMI acute coronary uh, syndrome patients who proceed to PCI. So um, it's an interesting finding that it's not recommended to administer uh, routine pretreatment with uh, P2Y12 receptor inhibitors to patients in whom the coronary anatomy is not known and early invasive manage management is planned. So these are uh, some of the most important, in my, in my opinion, uh, uh, changes in the guideline. Also following, following, uh, following the treatment, uh, uh, patients who cannot undergo early invasive treat, uh, uh, treatment, then uh, P2Y12 inhibitor may be considered de depending on bleeding risk, which is also logical in the, in the uh, uh, acute event and in the uh, clinical, clinical uh, setting. So uh, the escalation of P2, uh, P2Y12 inhibitor treatment, uh, switching from prasugrel to or ticagrelol to clopidogrel, which would deescalate the the uh, level of anti of uh, uh, treatment, may be considered as an alternative TAPT strategy for uh, patients deemed unsuitable for potent platelet inhibition. Uh, also, uh, in patients with atrial fibrillation with ShADVAS score uh, of uh, one or higher than one in men and uh, two or higher than two in women, after a short period of TAT up to one week, DAT is recommended at the default strategy using a NOAC at the recommended dose for stroke prevention and single oral uh, antiplatelet agent, prefer preferably clopidogrel. I uh, don't take my word for it. Uh, I cannot remember exactly who touched on this subject earlier, but uh, it was it was also also, also mentioned. And uh, discontinuation of antiplatelet in, in patients treated with OACs is recommended after 12 months. So uh, in the uh, pharmacological treatments, also there are uh, there are uh, differences where bivalirudine um, now may be considered. So has lost uh, value may be considered as an alternative to ultra fractionated heparin. Uh, and uh, also adding a second antithrombotic agent to aspirin for extended long-term secondary prevention should be considered in patients at high risk of ischemic events and without increased risk of major or life-threatening bleeding, which again is a logical conclusion because uh, this is, these are the patients we would want to have. So uh, lower uh, without the risk of major life-threatening bleeding. Uh, now, um, uh, also, as I mentioned before, there was a risk stratification for invasive, invasive approach. And this, uh, and this, was, uh, uh, this was done uh, in, in, uh, in uh, three risk groups in the uh, high, very high and low, uh, and low groups. Patient were, uh, were uh, uh, allocate, are allocated uh, according to some criteria, which uh, criteria, uh, which criteria Dr. Constantine earlier uh, touched on, and I will be just uh, numbering them. So hemodynamic instability, cardiogenic shock, uh, chest pain recurrent to, to best uh, to uh, optimal medical treatment, life-threatening arrhythmias, mechanical complications of MI, acute heart failure, clearly related to non-STEMI, non uh, non-STE acute coronary syndromes, and ST segment depression, more than one millimeter in six leads, plus ST segment elevation in the AVR and, and or V1, uh, would uh, suggest uh, an immediate invasive uh, uh, approach towards the patient. Why, while an earlier invasive approach, so in the, in the uh, 24 hours uh, after consulting or uh, after uh, uh, the complaints, 
uh, so would put uh, a patients in high risk group uh, with uh, established non STEMI diagnosis. A uh, dynamic or presumably new continuous STT uh, segment changes, uh, resuscitated cardiac arrest without ST segment elevation or cardiogenic shock, which is interesting, or a GRACE score of more than 140. Uh, all other patients uh, without these very high or high uh, characteristics would be put into the low risk group. Uh, the invasive treatment, so uh, as we, as I mentioned before, the invasive treatment uh, would be delay, would be an immediate or early or on the third group, a planned one. So uh, 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 I will just uh, come back to some of the, of the, of these uh, tables just to uh, complete and to uh, uh, complement the, the talk earlier. So uh, it's uh, interesting that complete revascularization should be considered in non-STE ACS patients without cardiogenic shock and with multivessel coronary artery disease. So this was emphasized while, uh, while the rest, uh, the rest is, uh, has already been said a bit, a bit earlier. Uh, now, as I mentioned before, they have uh, touched on the other I'm sorry to cut you. If yes. we can just conclude in one minute, we're very, very late. Thank you. Yes. Very much. Okay. So I will just, uh, there was a talk on SCAD, the spontaneous coronary artery dissection, and they have uh, uh, the treatment, let's say, let's get to, the, to that play. The optimal management for SCAD remains unclear since no randomized clinical trials have been com uh, comparing medical therapy to revascularization strategies. And uh, the, according to the MINOCA, uh, it is uh, besides, besides the, the criteria inclusive, uh, myocarditis and Takotsubo syndrome patients, uh, among other non ischemic conditions, have been labeled as MINOCA2. And the recommendations that uh, it's uh, recommended, uh, it's recommended, as uh, Dr. Ritu uh, said that uh, it's recommended to perform CMR in all MINOCA patients without an obvious underlying cause, which is a, a step forward. And another uh, part that has been mentioned is the quality indicators, the quantification of adherence to, to guideline recommendations, which is, has to do more with institutions following the best guidelines for revascularization. And those, uh, and those uh, uh, complete these seven steps uh, to be evaluated for best uh, treatment for our patients. So gaps in evidence remain, of course, in risk prediction modeling, medical treatment strategies, biomarkers, uh, long-term management and timing of angiography or, and revascularization strategies. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Aliu, for the detailed uh, briefing. Uh, seeing Professor Geiter here reminding me what he used to say to us, to young doctors, prevention, prevention, prevention from Serbia. So Biliana Parapid will present you insights into prevention. First question, am I unmuted? <laughs> okay. Yes, Thank you are. Host. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone on the ESC team. I'll try to not drown the fish, keep it the shortest possible. And for that, I would actually just try to... Um, I am a big sucker for history. So I think that we should just go on a short trip down good old memory lane, why we all wanted to go into medicine. So no matter what was the name of the subject or the course that we were taking, was it history, taking history of the patient or internal medicine propedeutics, I'm gonna take you back to the good old um, five fingers Proctor Harvey's approach. Some of you also know that I'm a W. Proctor Harvey teaching professor at Georgetown University School of Medicine and had the pleasure and privilege of, of learning alongside back in 2004. So, but to honor my, my two very dear colleagues and friends with whom I collaborate and who are sitting on this panel also, and that is Dr. Alice Nag, I'm gonna take the retrograde approach to the five fingers approach and I'll start with the fifth finger. The fifth finger used to be the labs. My biggest impression on, on, on anything you can do in prevention when we talk about labs, that's the reality check. We already heard about the reality trial results and 
Let's not forget, every time someone comes with a chest pain to your, to your clinic for the first time that you see him, how many of us check the hemoglobin levels? We had very important results in the reality trial that we already heard, and I'm not going to repeat them, but just don't forget that not all countries have it available to have the transfusion so fast. They cost a lot of money, and it's a very, very a tricky, tricky strategy that we are very grateful to to another mentor of mine, Professor Steg from Bisha, where I did my fellowship for running that trial together with Spanish colleagues. Now, the finger four was the X-ray. What is the X-ray of today? These are our guidelines, and we addressed all the guidelines tonight except for one, which I think that are actually the easiest to use, and that is something that our patients ask us every day, and that is the a rehabilitation and sports medicine guidelines. Grab them, please. We are underusing rehabilitation worldwide so much, and that doesn't cost a thing. The number three was ECG. ECG, thank God almighty, we still have them everywhere, in any form, and with all the gadgets that we have around us, don't be afraid to use it. We had a, we are a group that is promoting education through social media, through everything that is video technology. We have every Wednesday night with our Dr. Taman, also the telemed uh, chat on Twitter, where we try to promote the importance that actually show that it's the silver lining of the COVID pandemic. Huh? So uh, with if we do not uh, try to use what, what has been initially imposed to us, and that was technology, it would be very stupid of us not to use it. Finally, second thing, where the physical science. There is no good exam without the physical science. So let me remind you of something my other mentor, and that is Dr. Nanad Kaswanger, loves to say, and that is that women are not little men. With that said, I want to wish her a happy birthday because tomorrow she's turning 90. And according, according to Jewish tradition, her birthday starts on the eve of the day when she was born. So happy birthday, Dr. Winger. We all love you very much and we'll be celebrating next week in a live, in a live uh, party with you. But this is something that I would like to remind all of you. And that is we have seen a lot of data during the 40,000 abstracts. I, I went through them and sadly, there are only 66 publications that we have seen during this ESC that directly addresses sex differences in treating. What is that percentage, Mihai? Can you please calculate it for me? I love math, but 66 publications out of 40,000. Come on, we can do better and we have to do better. And finally, the first and most important thing, history. Share decision-making. That is the, something that we should all definitely embrace more and that guidelines all across the world right now are actually advising us to do, whether we're in Europe or in the United States. And when all of this said, I wish you all a very pleasant evening now that you get rid of us. And, uh, but before that, of course, ask us everything you want to ask us. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much, Bidiana. So. We, we passed a lot the, the, the timeline, but uh, I think we will manage to have uh, like five or 10 minutes of discussion. <clears throat> First of all, <coughs> I'd like to say hello to uh, Aisha Kader, which was the ambassador for uh, ESC Abstracts. Uh, Aisha, you can go online. Also, uh, hello to Fadi George, Hi. which is the president of the Young Academy of Cardiology. Hi, Fadi. And um, also, hello, hello. to Hani Raghi, uh, which, uh, uh, Honey, uh, was the overall ambassador, the ambassador boss for uh, the ESC Congress Twitter. So hi, uh, hi to all of you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and um, let's, uh, let's have uh, some, uh, some discussion. Dan, what do you think? Uh, do you have some questions? Unmute. Yes, I have to admit. Um, I congratulate all of you because uh, you, I, I learned a lot from your talks. And, Why I, you looking uh, for and I share with uh, the enthusiasm. And uh, I met uh, Nanette Wenger, uh, if you say Biliana, because my best friend is uh, in, uh, in Atlanta and I was there with Larry Sperling. And uh, Nanette Wenger is also one of my favorites. <laughs> So, uh, in fact, I wanted only to, to ask you, 
What uh, you impressed the most during this ESC Congress? In one word, in one sentence, what was memorable and uh, what we have to repeat next year? Please. Thank you for the question, Dan. So uh, let's, uh, let's go. Uh, I don't know who wants to, to take the word. I think everybody should uh, have, should, should be able to speak for at least 30 seconds to express. Uh, Can we, sorry to jump in. Can we give an opportunity to Aisha and Hani and Fadi to, to tell us their impressions? Because people heard enough from all of us, I believe. Hi, Hani. Agree. Hi, Just activate your mic. Okay, I'm unmuted now, right? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you very much. This was wonderful. Um, actually, your pictures on the beach in Mykonos were uh, very helpful to me in, um, in um, enduring the Cairo heat in the Congress. Every time I looked at you, I thought, okay, at least one of my friends is, uh, is on the beach. I loved it. And I loved the presentation today. Actually, um, all what was presented was amazing. But I also focused this year on the sessions of cardio-oncology. There were three or four sessions of cardio-oncology which were amazing and I would encourage all attendees today to look for them because the content is available all through September. And uh, every one of us should know what, is, uh, what has been said in cardio-oncology because that is basic cardio-oncology for the cardiologists. That's the minimum that any of us should know. Uh, other things were also sessions of big data from, um, from uh, Sweden, from Scandinavia mainly because they have all those databases about mortality of myocardial infarction, which is really dropping, about cardiogenic shock um, uh, treatment and uh, cardiac arrest after cardiogenic shock. Several things were, um, were actually quite excellent. Um, there were several immunology, uh, immunology and cardiology sessions. All these things are not in the highlights, but they're gems and please look for them and attend them. And also, one last thing is please look for, for the Doppler pitfalls. Uh, if you're interested in echocardiography, there was an amazing Doppler pitfalls presentation from Turkey, uh, which is really, really uh, worth seeing. Uh, thank you very much. And I know everybody's had a long time, so I'm not going to take any, any longer. No, you're not taking uh, any, any time, honey. It's a real pleasure to see you and to, to, to hear you. Uh, so, uh, hi, Fadi, how are you? Fadi is the president of the Young uh, Academy of Cardiology. You will have the Congress right away. Uh, do you, will, you, will you do an online Congress? I don't know if he's online. Yeah, we can see you, but we cannot hear you. Unmute, Fadi, please. But you can, you, you should unmute uh, your microphone. Let's see if I can read from here. Hi, Alexandro, me, hi, hi, hello, everyone. Now, now you can, yeah, can you hear me? I think I'm just unmuted, but I, I had a bit of unstable internet. Now it's okay? Yeah. Okay. Okay, perfect, perfect. Thank you all for inviting me as uh, one of the panelists. I'm, um, I'm really excited to, uh, to attend this meeting from the beginning. It was, uh, it was quite like um, a very substantial uh, collage, you know, of the of the whole trials and the, the whole events in the EC. Uh, it was really amazing, and uh, it was really interesting because it was just like you're cutting to the chase, you know, like um, uh, uh, it's very concise, and I think it was very easy to uh, to follow and capture. It was not like uh, boring or something by the uh, the other way around. Actually, it was very attractive. So I like it a lot, and I feel it like just like the the EC twenty twenty. It was just like you you put it up like in a capsule, you know, like in a cardiology capsule. So so um, it's very nice. It's very nice. I uh, I like it so much to it. Sorry, here. Fadi, we were uh, the you. poly pill. Sorry, I just had uh, I think a bit of unstable internet. Uh, you, you can hear me now, guys. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Biliana, maybe you should uh, ask him one more time the question. No, I said oh, I fully agree we were like the poly pill tonight. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fadi. Uh, thank you very much. So, uh, thank you. Dan, um, uh, I will, I will uh, maybe repeat your question. So, what did you think? What, what uh, did you think about the Congress? What, what did what what's um, 
what stick to your head, you know, uh, uh, after this this congress? So, uh, Constantine, what do you think? What 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 are the good points, the bad points? What uh, should we put into practice? I think uh, coming back maybe to uh, to my presentation again, I think uh, what I like is the non-STEMI guidelines. They uh, put some new advices um, that are, let's say, uh, people will discuss about it. I liked um, that a lot. I also liked a lot the sports cardiology uh, guidelines. Um, to finally have real guidelines for advocating uh, sports and exercise. Um, <clears throat> In terms of cardiogenic shock, I think we're now entering finally an era where we will have evidence sooner or later for what we are doing on a daily basis. Um, and uh, this, in this regard, many, several very good presentations, especially by Holger Thiele, who, is, uh, uh, who just said, I don't know. Don't ask me. I don't know. Let's do the trials and find out uh, about that. So those are my take home uh, points. Thanks, Constantine. Thank you very much. Uh, so, what about Ritu? Ritu, thank you. You you just you synthesized everything in in uh, in three minutes. So, thank you for that. And everything was very clear. The me clear the message stuck st st stuck to to you know you know to my brain. Uh, what do you think? Do you think uh, um, do you, what what do you how do you see the the next congresses and uh, what do you think uh, uh, are further perspectives? I think we are going to stay at least some part in a digital format. It's essential to have more than 100,000 uh, people, participants is mind blowing actually to think. And it was uh, marvelous to see the map again uh, that was put up of the world. And I felt that the ESC was all about expanding boundaries, getting rid of boundaries. I felt like, the John Lennon song, Imagine, you know, where the, the, that resonated with me, um, thinking, you know, we're all together in this. We're all trying to learn to take care of patients for wherever we are in the world. And it's so important. And ESCs really set the standard now for all of us um, that we must engage, we must teach, we must work together to make cardiovascular care the best it can be worldwide. So it's going to be tough to, to beat that. Fully <laughs> agree. Fully agree. Uh, Mirvat, what do you think? So, um, you know, ESC uh, broke the, the, the charts. Um, there was double the registration um, this year and double the participation, which was actually impressive. Uh, I know one of my main concerns was as registration, you could see that registration going up, that something's going to happen to the platform and um, it's going to collapse, but it actually didn't help through fantastic. And um, so I think we probably will be seeing um, in the future a hybrid um, programs and hybrid congresses that will allow people that can't travel, particularly early careers and young, and perhaps Aisha can, um, you know, tell us a little bit more about that. Um, and, and, you know, the people who can travel and be there can be there as well. Yeah, I fully agree, I fully agree. Thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, Ahmed and uh, Filonid, and you, what do you think? Do you think this type of Congress is, uh, who, 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 um, who, uh, who advantages most this type of Congress? Like, do you think this, this uh, uh, digital Congress attracts more young people? What do you think, dear friends? Uh, yes, for sure, uh, it attracts uh, the young generation mainly, I agree, and it allow um, a wide availability of all lectures uh, for free for those who can't travel, who, for those who are busy uh, at the time of Congress. Uh, I think, uh, as the Dr. Mervit said, we should think about the hybrid meeting in the future to be the, um, the format for uh, the, the large or the most important Congress as it allow the young generation to attend from their place for free and even they can go back for the recorded uh, lecture at any time this will the, um, uh, and uh, dissemination of uh, the guidelines the most important messages 
Razi Ahmed. What do you think, Aliou? Yeah, um, Ahmed said it well. Ahmed said it well. So um, really, it's important for young people also. But I'm seeing this on a on a different side too. Uh, we are still thinking like men, let's say. So uh, this Congress was easier to attend by women who have young kids, who have children. So it's been uh, much easier for everyone uh, to uh, reap the benefits. Uh, or let's say uh, from uh, uh, parts of the world who are financially struggling and who cannot afford or mm, who are struggling to, to travel and uh, to, to have all the expenses uh, uh, covered. Uh, this has been a great uh, opportunity for them uh, to enjoy the Congress for, from their home, from their comfort, without spending and uh, in their time because everything is recorded. So uh, really uh, it's, uh, it's been providing better and, uh, and uh, um, uh, worldwide uh, healthcare to everyone in the world, not only specific richer, let's say, countries. So I think it's, it's the yin on the yang. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Aliou. I will give the word to Aisha. Hi, Aisha, how are you? And then afterwards, Hi, Aisha. I and Dan can close the session. Hello, everyone. So very nice to see you. I feel like we're all together, despite the boundaries. Uh, I would agree with a lot of what's been said. I think the SC this time was truly global. It uh, transcended all boundaries. And the fact that more than 50% of registrants were from the young community is, I think, no coincidence. We could attend a lot of sessions and in addition to the content, I'd also like to encourage everyone to have a look at ESC abstracts because there were over 4,000 abstracts and most of them are probably from the young community. And uh, there was a lot of interesting work that was highlighted there as well. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it was really, really nice seeing you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for joining. So Mihai and Dan, maybe you want to, uh, to uh, um, uh, close the session. I think that I will go and I will let uh, Dan uh, to be last. First of all, thank you very much for attending this uh, webinar. Indeed, it was a great uh, experience, but keep in touch because here at Telecardiology will bring you more and new experiences. So just check your emails. Surprise for this year and for the next year. I cannot say any more, but it will be huge. Thank you very much. And Dan, you have the mic. I always wanted to say this. Oh, thank you so much, Alex, for inviting me here. Uh, I am full of energy now, uh, despite of the fact that it's 9.43 in Romania, so I have to go to sleep, but I am staying like a running now full of energy, a boost of energy. And thanks to you, the life is uh, nicer and uh, it's nice that uh, we are the dreamers and of course we are not alone. Thank you once again, keep the rhythm and congratulations for what you're doing. Thank Stay you so safe. Much. This is really a teamwork. So uh, thank, you, thank all of you for participating. I know one hour and a half, it's a huge of your amount of your time. Thank you so much. And uh, maybe uh, we, uh, we will get to uh, soon uh, to another uh, update webinar. So uh, I really, really thank you uh, for participating and uh, I wish to have you a pleasant evening. Thank you so much once again. Bye. 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 Bye.